Thank you all for coming. I'm Hal Varian. I'm the chief economist uh, here at Google, and we economists like to stick together, so I brought you a reinforcement uh, today. Uh, Professor Ian Golden was the founding director of the Oxford Martin School from September 2006 to September 2016. He's currently the Oxford University Professor of Globalization and Development and director of the Oxford Martin Program on Technological and Economic Change. And he's also a senior fellow at the Oxford Martin School and a professorial fellow at the Balliol College, uh, University of Oxford. From 2003 to 2006, he was vice president of the World Bank and prior to that, the bank's director of development policy. And he served in the bank's senior management team and led the bank's collaboration with the United Nations and other partners, mm -hmm. as well as with key countries. As a director of the development project, he played a pivotal role in the research and strategy to enter the bank. There's much, much more, but I'm going to stop at that point because I know you're anxious to hear what Ian has to say. And there'll be questions afterwards, a little bit of a few questions from me, a few questions from the Dory, and of course, uh, people who are here. So, Ian. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's a huge pleasure to be at Google and to be able to talk about my new book, Age of Discovery, in the context of the tumultuous changes in the world and try and make sense of this incredible time that we live in. It's a time, if we can have the first video running, it's a time of magic in many respects and just spending the last couple of hours here and getting a sense of some of the things, and I'm sure there's many, many others that I'm not aware of that are happening here. One can't but feel that one is in a period of discovery, an age of discovery which is unprecedented in human history, which will lead to changes for the better for many and many people around the world. The way I think about this period is not as the fourth industrial revolution, which I think diminishes in an extent the way in which this is transforming the world and the pace and scale of what's happening. I think about it more as a renaissance moment because that was a tumultuous moment. That was a period that took Europe from being one of the most backward places in the world in 1450 to by far the most advanced place within an 80 year period. A period that changed everything in Europe permanently and then around the world and that was associated with the most extraordinary advances in science, in arts, in perspective that the world had ever known. It was driven like our revolution, by an information revolution. Then it was the Gutenberg Press. Before that, a very small number of people, a very small share of the European population could read or write. Books were extremely expensive, handwritten, manuscripts, and it was really the clergy, the Catholic Church, that had a monopoly of knowledge. They told people what to think, how to think, and of course in that environment it was impossible to really do science. What this revolution did was allowed an exponential growth in information flows, rather similar to what we've seen in the last 20 years. Over 25 million books were printed in a 50-year period, billions of political pamphlets, advertisements, short treatises, and so on. And we celebrate today, 500 years later, the outcome of that information revolution. Of course, the fundamental transformation of art, of Botticelli's, Michelangelo's, Da Vinci's, that changed perspective in remarkable ways and symbolized people from being objects whose fate was ordained to creators of their own fate. And that was the dramatic change that happened in the way that philosophy and art was understood. But it was also time, of course, of scientific invention and revolution, Copernicus discovering that we went around the sun, not being the center of the universe. Fundamental challenges to what the church and authority had said, and of course, compass and other designs which allowed the voyages of discovery, including the discovery of the Americas and total circumnavigation changing commerce and creating globalization 1.0, disintermediating in very rapid ways the old flows, the places like Venice, which had been at the center of them, finding their prices dropped by 50% over a two to three year period as the new ways of getting to the east were discovered. 
Our time is associated with political and technical transformation, which is much more global, much more rapid, but is having, I think, an echo of that effect. The Berlin Wall for me symbolizes this coming down of barriers, physical barriers, political and ideological barriers. And we move to a world which was very fragmented in the 80s to a world now which is hyper-integrated. And this hyper-integration brings very many different possibilities and is already, I believe, an engine of change which is more rapid than at any period in history. And that's why today is the slowest day we'll know for the rest of our lives. The innovation machine has been put on a higher level than it ever has been in history. I was living in Paris when this wall came down. I'm a South African. I didn't think I would ever be able to go to South Africa again in my lifetime. I was involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. And I was working at the OECD in Paris. And I thought it was an amazing thing, but I didn't imagine for a minute that it would transform my own life. Of course, what we know is that two months later, as a result of that process, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. He came to Paris. He asked me to be his economic advisor, to go back to South Africa and run the state bank, which I did. And recognize in that process, in retrospect, that things that seem totally unconnected to our lives in this new hyper-integrated world will touch them in intimate new ways. And that's going to happen at a global sphere to all of us. And so what globalization, by which I mean integration, flows across national borders of goods, services, products, but most significantly of ideas, means that we move into a different period in history. And this has been accelerated greatly by the parallel development, of course, of the web at the same time as the Berlin Wall came down. And scientific discovery, exemplified in the Hubble spacecraft, which was the beginning of a new era in the same way as the Renaissance was. We now, 27 years later, in a world of a total integration, a new nervous system of the world, where we can experience and empathize and see things at the other end of the world in real time whether it's a birthday party celebration or whether it's understanding the impact of a climate event or war. In this extraordinary exponential growth, we've lost our innocence. We know what is happening everywhere in dramatic new ways. And so it's no accident that we become aware of climate change. We become aware of things that were simply unknown in their depth and scale before. And with that comes new responsibilities new potential to unlock some of the greatest challenges humanity has ever faced, but also new potential to destabilize. We've become a complex dynamic system as a global community. And that means that attribution, cause and effect, understanding what is going to shape our future is more difficult than at any moment in history because of the number of actors and participants and the speed of evolution. Prediction is more difficult than ever before. Part of the excitement, of course, is how rapidly these technologies have spread. And that's, again, very different to all previous revolutions of technology and very different to the Renaissance as well. So we move from a world of only about 200 million people sharing the same data and information in the 80s to a world today of around 6 billion people sharing information and data. We move from a world where there were only 2 billion people literate in the late 80s to a world of 6.5 billion literate people today. And if you believe in that literacy and education capability as a driver of change, there are 4.5 billion more drivers of change over this very short period of time. I believe in the random distribution of exceptional talent, call it genius if you want, there's a lot more Mozart, Shakespeare's, and Einstein's out there that will emerge from the streets of Sao Paulo, Soweto, Mumbai, or Shanghai, as well as, of course, this neighborhood, that will change our lives. But it's not individuals that bring change. It's people learning from each other. It's sparks. It's learning, which is a cooking of lots of different ideas, and often ingredients which are surprising. 
that is happening in a totally different way. Because people are learning faster, there's also a lot more of us. Ideas have traveled, which are leading people to live longer, healthy ideas. Very simple ideas, like smoking kills you, wearing a condom protects you from HIV, ideas like that, and very complex ideas, like those embedded in the vaccines, cures for cancer, medicines, going around the world. With this, we have this extraordinary, most rapid growth in population the world's ever known, two billion more people. And it's that as well which shapes our future. Because as people escape poverty, and the most extraordinary thing about this period of history is that despite the increase in the world's population of 2 billion, there are 300 million less desperately poor people. That's never happened historically before. This integration of the world, the spread of markets, this growth of jobs, of opportunities and knowledge fundamentally, has led to the most rapid reduction in poverty the world's ever known. And with that as well, the most rapid urbanization process. When people come together, they change their lives. They get the means to change their lives and their possibilities. Far from the world becoming more flat, it's becoming much more mountainous. Meaning, place matters more than ever. And you see that here in Mountain View, and you see it in Mumbai, you see it in London, you see it in other dynamic cities. The ratio of incomes to house prices uh, is at record high. And that's because place matters more than ever. In this process, we not only find, of course, huge leaps in development and possibility, but also the spillovers of our actions become more and more acute. And it's that spillover effect that is in tension with markets. It's the markets and the opportunities which have created these possibilities, but now the questions are, how do we engage with markets? How do we tamper, if we want, with the signals? How do we hold back to ensure that the externalities or spillover effects of development, the commons challenges, don't destroy all the gains. The unexpected consequences of globalization is not a new thing. We know that the voyages of discovery that came to the Americas led to the death of most Native Americans. We know that the voyages that went, when they went back, brought syphilis and other diseases that killed many hundreds of thousands of the Europeans. The idea that integration and globalization brings risk as well as opportunity is one that we forget at our peril. And it's not simply that it brings that risk, but it also brings the risk of extremism, and that's one of the key lessons of the Renaissance. Although we celebrate it for its amazingly rapid advance, in fact, it was socially and politically a disastrous period. It was associated with rising extremism and after this flourishing of diversity and tolerance in a city like Florence, we had Savonarola, an extremist monk, deposing the Medicis and basically creating a religious republic of extreme views, hounding out diversity, gays, Muslims, Jews, that had gone to the city because it was the place to be for anyone that really wanted to be at the forefront of creativity. And that creativity happened because of the diversity. 35% of the population of Florence in its heyday was foreign. This reaction was because of the corruption of the church. You could buy your way to heaven with indulgences. You could pay for people to go on pilgrimages for you as well as the fact that the benefits of globalization were not seen by most people. The gold that came back from the New World did not benefit most people, nor did the spices and other things. And of course, the scribes were put out of work. What you had in that process then was a pushback, a fracturing of the church, inquisitions and religious wars that were fought across Europe and spilled over indeed into the corridors of my college, Balliol, at Oxford, where people were killed in these religious wars. One of the most terrifying echoes of that period today 
is the hounding of science and intellectuals. The arrest, the denunciation of expertise and of knowledge and the recreation of ideology as, and religion as being what needed to guide us. Now fast forward, we see the similar risks emerging from globalization 2.0, our time. The interconnectedness does not only connect good things and the most extraordinary opportunities, but also new risks. The swine flu that starts in Mexico City is in 160 countries in 30 days. And the emerging infections group in the Oxford Martin School, which I founded. It's a group of 350 faculty from across the whole university, medicine, sciences, social sciences, humanities, coming out of their disciplines to work on interdisciplinary problem solving. So our group working on emerging infections finds the swine flu spread exactly replicates airline traffic. The super spreaders of the goods of globalization are also the super spreaders of the bads, in this case, airport hubs. Another key lesson of that Renaissance period, which has a much amplified echo today, is the role of individuals. And it was Savonarola using the printing press to spread ideas which challenged authority. Small groups of individuals. And that's what we've seen today. One area where this has been exemplified, as always finance is at the frontiers of globalization, is in the banking system. Bearings and Bank was established in 1762. It had existed for over 240 years, withstanding the most extraordinary technological economic and political transformations in the world, when one day the management woke up and discovered that a kid using new technology had bankrupted them, Nick Leeson. This potential that the new technologies and this interconnectedness gives to new asymmetries, where small groups or single individuals can bring down very, very complex systems. The one I worry most about is biopathogens. For exponentially declining prices, people can build measles, smallpox, etc., put on a drone and fly it down our streets. This potential to cause mass havoc is one that is spreading in many areas, not least in the cybersphere, which of course, as the nervous system of our new world, is absolutely integral. But it's also being used by extremist forces as it was in the Renaissance. ISIS has become the largest recruiter of foreign fighters since the Spanish Civil War using social media. So how to manage the freedoms and the integration in a way that manages the complexity and builds a resilience is absolutely key. Finance, as always, is at the forefront of globalization. It has the resources to invest in new technologies and it's a hyper-integrated system. What we learned from the financial system, of course, is that the best system in the world of expert management, that's finance. Just think about our national governments, the central banks like the Fed Reserve or the Treasury, in all countries are the most sophisticated, best staffed, best paid of our national institutions. And at the global level, the IMF is similarly so. It is in a different league to the UN agencies and others in its expertise, data, and power. And yet this expert system with over 20,000 PhDs, many of them coming from institutions that Hal and I would be proud to have given students to these institutions, failed dismally. A very narrow mandate, financial stability, so much brain power, so much pay. No wonder people say we don't trust authority, we don't trust experts. When the most expert of the global systems failed so dismally. Would we have the politics in the US today if there hadn't been a financial crisis? Would we have Brexit? Would we have rising extremism as we've seen? I think not. I think as much as anything what we've seen is a failure of experts to be able to anticipate and understand this complex dynamic system and it's operating in many, many domains. Another key failure of globalization of this period has been, as in the Renaissance, rising inequality. And the reason is that when things change more rapidly, people get left behind more quickly. When you look at the share of the top 1% in income distribution or wealth, 
across the OECD countries. There's a rising trend everywhere, most acute in the US, but also significant in many, many other countries. And so a key question is how do we have a more inclusive system? How do we ensure that people see globalization as good for them, not as something that's locking them out? When you look at the data that people like Angus Deaton and uh, Anne Case have assembled and others, you see that in towns in the Midwest in the US, the life expectancy of people is lower than their parents. Their job mobility is lower than their parents. Their unemployment rates are higher than their parents. No wonder people don't believe that the system's working for them. They want to go back to something which they think will help them. And this is a global trend where place and skill matters more than ever. So how we create a society which is more inclusive and how we think about these issues really does matter, not least to the future. This will become more and more acute. It's been a pleasure to be able to talk to Hal and the people here about this as we move to a world of automation. You might have seen work that a group I created in the Oxford Martin School has done suggesting that 47% of US jobs are vulnerable to machine intelligence over the next 20 years. And a higher share of countries like China, where there's more routine and rules-based jobs. Now these numbers are contested and there's a big debate around them. And of course, we don't know about the new jobs. This is a vital discussion. But where the jobs will be, how one will have the skills, et cetera, is significant. And one of the amazing things that Google's done in recent weeks is, of course, allocate a big, big assignment of money to building these skills and capacities. For developing countries, there's a particular challenge because our model of development is that countries go from basic agriculture and raw materials through a stage of development which involves semi-skilled work, routine, rules-based work, whether it's in manufacturing of textiles or other products, or whether it's in call centers, or whether it's in back offices. And the question is, what happens if the middle rungs of a development ladder are removed by artificial intelligence? We don't know the answers to these questions, but the questions we have to explore. The sense that the system is evolving more rapidly, that there's growing inequality and growing risk, is based on real concerns. These are not imagined. The politicians play into these and are able to raise fears and suggest, I believe, totally falsely, that a world of higher protection, of keeping out foreigners, will be a better world and that we can somehow return to an imagined past that was not better, but they say was. The reason this is profoundly misguided is because as we go forward, we will more and more have to manage collectively, together, these challenges because of the spillover effects. Whether it's examples like the example we'll be familiar with of the North Atlantic Cod, or whether it's the newer things like climate change, which is a dramatic global threat, coordination of an integrated system becomes more and more significant. And working out collective responses and responsibilities. Of course, nature knows no price. The rhino don't reproduce more when their horns are worth more, what economists call inelastic supply. And how we allocate these scarce resources in a world where rising incomes gives people the capabilities to demand more and more. One answer that will not be sustainable is that if you have enough money, you can do what you want, buy the rhino horn or anything else. Of course, we also know that ecological systems have natural thresholds. It's fine if 200 million people in the world take antibiotics, but if 2 billion people take them, none of them are likely to be effective. And so how one manages in a world where they're increasing spillovers, where our decisions, whatever they are, affect others and others' decisions affect us because we're connected, because we've escaped poverty, becomes more and more significant. So we're not simply connected, we're entangled. There is no optionality in this world. There's no wall high enough that will keep out climate change, that will keep out a pandemic, but what it will keep out is the cooperative ability to manage and of course the technologies and the people that will help us manage. And so how we go forward with this 
is going to be crucial. I'm optimistic because we're moving into a world where we can draw on the global talent pool. And this is different to anything in history. The Renaissance and the revolutions in science and technology of the past were largely driven by white males out of a very small number of countries. We're now in a world where we can draw on the total capacity of the human species. And that is the greatest source of optimism. If you believe, as I do, in the power that this unlocks, and that's why innovation is accelerating and problem solving, change making is accelerating. But it, it's a battle of ideas. It's a battle of ideas which needs to engage scientists, technologists, and all those that believe in progress. The Oxford Martin Stem Cell Group is amongst many, many in the world who are doing amazing things that give me optimism. This is the lab technician's skin turned into a heart cell. And there are frontiers of genetics and others that can lead us all to believe that we can live longer, healthier, and better lives. There's also massive disruption happening in politics. Not only extremism is growing, the capacity of people to recreate, as Macron did, from absolutely nothing, with no political party at all, a different alternative view, is a sign of how easy it's becoming to change and to be a change maker. One doesn't need the old authorities as one didn't when the printing press was developed to create a revolution in ideas. And what we've also seen is encouraging signals that science does matter and get listened to, not least in the climate agreements. And of course, we need to redouble our efforts to make sure that they're implemented. Causes for optimism abound. There's no problem that one cannot imagine a solution for. The question is whether we as change makers, whether as we as developers of new capability are able to amplify the goods and dampen the, bow, the bads to ensure that as we go forward on this extraordinary planet, this will not be, as Lord Martin Rees has suggested, possibly our final century, but it will be the century that we celebrate as we celebrate the Renaissance in 500 years' time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, inspirational talk, I should say. Um, but I have a question about the book. I read your book, and it has a very nice structure. I think people will enjoy looking at this with a uh, exploiting or describing the parallels between the Renaissance and today. And you did this with a colleague, Chris Gutarna, is that mm -hmm. right? A doctoral student. Yep. Who is a, who is a uh, historian uh, of the Renaissance. No, he's a political science major focusing on China today. Oh. But I just distracted him, and his supervisor didn't like that. Oh, I see. So he distracted <laughs> yeah, him. He, he started as my RA and ended up as a, as a as co-author because co he's so brilliant and did so much. Yeah. Well, what I was interested in is your working style. Okay. Uh, I've written co-author books, uh, and uh, everybody develops their own technique for doing this. I'm curious as to how you... Uh, did this. So um, Chris, uh, who quite remarkably managed to get both a book and his doctorate <laughs> out within a year of each other, um, was doing his uh, doctorate at Oxford. I asked around uh, for his, not this project, a previous project, uh, for some professors to recommend their top students. We started working together and I was deeply impressed by him. Um, I think the most significant part of our collaboration was that we just sparked off each other. And this goes back to this point of how innovation happens. Uh, we had totally different views. He's got, I'm an economist. He's an international relations major. Uh, he worked on China mainly. I knew about other places. He, our areas of knowledge do not overlap that much. Um, but we, we challenged each other, and I think that was uh, increasingly useful, particularly as I began to respect him more and more, and, and he became more effective at challenging me uh, in that. So um, it was a great process, and um, it took a long time, and it was a big worry for me, because I was worried that he would drop out of his doctorate and I would be in deep trouble <laughs> <laughs> um, if that happened. Um, 
but he, he, he's smart enough and well managed enough to be able to do both. And the book took a long time, five years, and his doctorate took a long wow. time. And that's most probably uh, one, one expression of that. But his, his doctorate's actually a very interesting doctorate on, on the Chinese middle class. And he lived there for, for two years uh, while doing that. Wow, involved with the book as well? Uh, he kept going back. He'd sort of come back from his primary research, but, but kept going back to Beijing. Yeah. Wow. So let's switch over to the substance of the book uh, now. Um, and you alluded to this in your talk, the issue of artificial intelligence and jobs. Of course, you might imagine here at Google, we're very focused on this question. And, and I would say from my reading of the existing literature, there's no consensus, really. but what would it take to create that consensus? Or what kind of research do you think is valuable? How could you, um, how could we, understand more what we yeah. might encounter in the future? I, I mean, remarkably, every, everything is changing so rapidly. This is a new field of work. Um, you know, we, I, we were one of the first movers um, in 2013, uh, not long ago, in bringing out a paper uh, on it. Um, and there's been a lot of papers since then, but it's a very, very recent area. One of the great challenges, of course, is that um, we know a lot about what's vulnerable, but we don't know that the vulnerability will lead to loss. You can have, for example, supermarket checkout now in any supermarket in the world, but let's say in the US, done by a machine, but you still have over a million people employed in supermarket checkout because of preferences, because of pace of adoption, because of various other tasks that these people do. Um, and so, Saying that something it can be done by machine doesn't mean it will be. The second thing is we have zero knowledge about new jobs, or very close to. We very uh, even for the next five years, let alone ten or twenty years, and that makes it very difficult uh, to to come to a consensus. Um, it, there's been very few new jobs actually being created, but they could be accelerated. So I think what we need to do, Helen, it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here and it's a great pleasure to be here, is we need, to, I think, to be creating a community of scholars and of others that think about this issue. It's a global issue. Most of the work has been done with the US because the data statistics are much the best here. But if we think it's a big issue for the US, it's a much bigger issue for China mm -hmm. or Mexico uh, or many other countries. And you know, as we discussed, we've got to put this together with the demographics, with the economic right. geography, with the regulatory environments, with all sorts of other factors um, to, to try and make sense of it. So it's a long way of saying we need a lot of people working collaboratively on this and coming together. Academics are competitive, that's good. Uh, but sort of the creatively competitive, I think, together. Over at lunch, we were talking about some of these demographic issues. And of course, there's this huge impact of China's one-child policy. We yeah. have a lot of population now. The workforce is going to decline dramatically in the, in the next couple of decades. And one example you mentioned in the book, which I think was uh, very important, was the Black Death. Now, the Black Death was a terrible event. It killed a third of the people in Italy. But if you were lucky enough to stay alive, your wage went time. way up, your living standard went way up, feudalism was under pressure, simply because you went from a surplus of labor really to a dramatic shortage of labor. And if you look at China, Japan, hmm. North Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, uh, Germany, Italy, Spain, on and on and on, the developed countries are going to see declines in the labor force, outright declines. And maybe they'll have the same uh, beneficial characteristic that we. I, th I think that's right, and and, the, and what the intersection of these <clears throat> forces is going to be is interesting. Um, interestingly enough, China's neighbors, um, South Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, or well, that's maybe part of China, um, have lower fertility rates than it does, yes. with no one-child policy. So this is this is this is not, a, and and Germany has an even lower rate. Uh, so this is, this is absolutely the case. Um, I think real wages will double in China over the next five years or so, be driven by the mm -hmm. intersection of demographic and economic forces. And then you're going to have AI. Uh, and 
Uh, a key question on the demographics, of course, is how long people will work. I think we will we'll end with retirement will stop. And then you get into the discussion, which is a big economics discussion, about where's pensions and savings and retirement money going to come from? And what's it going to do bet to transfers between the elderly and the young? AI has a major role to play in trying to resolve some of these tensions. And the consequences in China the US, depending on what you do with immigration policy, uh, Europe, and then Africa will be very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this needs, in the end, to be something we look at at a country level uh, and, and think through in a much deeper way. Absolutely. If you look at Nigeria, for example, or India, these countries are actually growing younger Absolutely. compared to the developed <laughs> world, which is growing, uh, growing yep. substantially uh, older. Yep. And productivity. You know, you alluded to that. Productivity is the key. If you have a smaller labor force and you have a growing population, yep. which is true of many countries, the only solution to maintain liber uh, living standards is improvement of productivity. Yep. But then we come to the productivity puzzle, yep. even though we think we're producing all sorts of great technology and wonderful gadgets and services, the uh, economic statistics Disagree. Yeah, it's it really. What's the it, problem? <laughs> well, I, I, I put I, him under the spot. I, I wish I knew the answer. Maybe I'd get a Nobel Prize if I did. Um, it's one of the toughest, uh, toughest economic questions, and, it, and you know, Bob Gordon uh, has, has posed this, uh, and many others saying that basically we don't see. We argue. I think you feel as well. I certainly feel that innovation is accelerating and yet productivity is stagnating. What's going on here? So uh, this is a major question. I think there's a whole series of, of reasons for this. One is measurement. My iPhone has destroyed the camera industry, the music industry, the GPS industry, uh, and a whole lot of other uh, manufacturing industries. I feel better off for it. Uh, but the camera manufacturers, the uh, film manufacturers, the GPS manufacturers are losing output, so we get negative. Mm -hmm. uh, statistics out of something like that. So one is measurement, um, which is which is very very imperfect and doesn't cope with digi the digital economy at all. A second issue is is innovation being concentrating in just a small part of the economy. So where we think innovation is great in genetics and AI and everything else, most of the country is actually dying. When things change more rapidly, you have to renew your stock of infrastructure of plant of everything more rapidly. And if you don't, it's increasingly worthless. And I think that's happening in a bigger and bigger share of businesses. Mm -hmm. So actually, they are becoming less productive more rapidly because the pace of change is so rapid. Another issue is inequality. Another issue is aging and demographics because these productivity numbers are aggregates for the whole economy. Yep. Um, and this goes back to the point I made about uh, the Midwest. They're big parts of the country that are not the dynamic cities. Uh, where things are really moving. And I think what we need is a much more nuanced understanding, and then you get into the question of, all right, how do you spread the benefits of productivity more broadly? And, and just to add to your list, there are two other features, which is the role of intangibles, software Absolutely. and design, yep. Yep. where all of the software for the mobile phone and for in Not fact, all the way, yeah, so it's made here in, uh, in California. Mm. Uh, the hardware, for the most part, is made abroad and splitting those two pieces out with respect to uh, productivity is very, very tricky. And yep. I think yep. we have views on this. The BLS does their best, but it's still, uh, it's still a problem. And, and the related problem is, of course, services. 80% of the GDP in the US is services. Very, very hard to measure quality improvements yep. or productivity yep. improvements in that, uh, in that area. Um, one proposal, I guess, to deal with this uh, changing world and the potential of having uh, unemployed labor. I, I say potential because I don't think either of us believes that that's a likely outcome. But uh, one proposal has been a universal basic income. That's uh, become popular in Silicon Valley circles. What, what's your view on yeah. the UBI? Well, just I, I do think there will be um, people, by the way, uh, unemployed because of uh, the pace of change. I think there really are. Sure. Um, and to me, 
uh, this is about economic geography. It's about people being locked out of the dynamic cities. You have very low unemployment in some places and very high unemployment in other places, but you can't get from where you, uh, those people can't, the same, can't move to where the jobs are, and that's a big issue. I think UBI is not a good idea. I have four uh, main objections to it. The first is that um, unless it's at a level which is so high uh, that it becomes fiscally irresponsible, in other words, it blows the budget of the government, and particularly in austerity times like now, that's difficult to imagine. It leads to rising poverty and inequality, and the OECD has done great work on this, and the simple reason is that you remove targeted transfers, child benefit, housing benefit, unemployment benefit, disability benefit, etc., and you substitute for that a cash transfer or a mass transfer that everyone in the country is getting. It's called universal because even the billionaires get it. And the numbers just don't add up. The poor people and the people that need transfers most do worse off, and the OECD's shown this. The second reason I don't like it is because all the evidence I've seen is that when people are paid to stay home, they become very depressed, they become opioid addicts, they become alcoholics, uh, they become socially dysfunctional, and that we do not want a society where basically we're paying a significant part of our society to stay at home um, because people get status, network, income, and many other things out of work which is vital for their own sense of self-worth and community. The third reason I don't like it is because I think it postpones a much more fundamental conversation about the future of work, which is the value we give to social work, to creative work, to caring, to um, volunteerism, to mentoring, and all of that. Uh, and the fourth reason I don't like it is because I think the people that are advocating it are basically trying to postpone a deeper debate. It's the way of sort of ticking a box in their consciousnesses and their political agenda and saying, don't worry about all these issues, we'll look after you. And I think that's both paternalistic and counterproductive because we need uh, something else for our societies. We need a deeper debate about, and it goes back to the measurement question about well-being, about status, about inclusive globalization, etc. It's not affordable in the US. It's even less affordable in you know, a developing country like China or Mexico or South Africa. If we look at, uh, suppose we're right that we are seeing a lot of innovation and more so in the future, uh, this innovation that's created mostly in the developed countries, um, how will that fit in to the kind of resources available in the less developed countries, the underdeveloped countries? Is this going to be bad news for China, uh, sorry, not China, but uh, for India and Nigeria? Yeah, I, th I worry most about Africa. Yeah. Um, rapid population growth, very young population. I don't understand yet. <laughs> we need to work on it. You know, I'd love to collaborate with you. What the development ladder is, what other possibilities are. The way that our parents and grandparents and previous generations dealt with these challenges was to move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a third of Europe migrated, a third of Sweden, a third of Ireland, a third of Italy moved when they lost their jobs or there was a famine or a war or something like that. That's why the U.S. is what it is, because people came here, uh, particularly risk takers. That option is being closed out. So people are locked in their countries now. And if they're locked in a country where you don't see a development ladder, some places might be lucky and have tourism uh, or some other opportunity. But the generalizable model, some commodities might be, become valuable, but we know there's a resource curse. Um, I think this is a really deep question that, that, that we need to think about. India is so big and diverse and it's growing quickly, it hopefully will get over its hump before the major effects. But I think there's some places like Africa uh, which, where it's difficult for me today to see how this will be beneficial. Of course, many things are beneficial in AI, mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. banking and all that. But I'm talking about the fundamental questions of jobs. So one of the, uh, I'm going to shift to the Dory questions here. One of the uh, popular prescriptions for economic hardship nowadays is to reverse project, uh, progress, to stop globalization, to yeah. limit free trade, bring jobs back home. Why haven't we come up with a more progressive competing solution to that narrative? I think we urgently do. I think there are. We haven't won the arguments. 
You know, Macron was interesting in the, in the, in the French presidential election, because as far as I know, he's the only global big leader uh, that has come up. He said, no, we want, and Francis is not, globalization is yes. not a good word, yes. you know, but he said, I'm pro-globalization, I'm pro-Brussels, uh, I'm pro all these things that everyone else was saying were bads, and he won by a landslide. Which was sort of not predictable, I think, it, 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 for us. Maybe with Google Analytics it wasn't, but I certainly <laughs> didn't predict it. And so I think you can come up with a compelling narrative. But, you know, but it's, it's a, re, a na narrative that we hear, certainly from people like Jeremy Corbyn in the UK yeah. and many others, which is backward uh, uh, looking in that. And I think, you know, I hope there's a generation of younger leaders. This woman that's just won the election in, in, in New Zealand, Jacindra, oh, yeah. uh, you know, 37 years old, just completely overwhelming the old Labour Party there. It, those are the signs of real hope for me. Well, it is amazing, particularly Macron, and not only did he manage to push the globalization uh, ideas for, but the Labour liberalization, which yeah. is stymied French Absolutely. leaders for what? Brave man. <laughs> 20 years, 15 years. And every economist who looked at the situation in France or in Italy or Spain said, you have to liberalize your labor markets, but it's extremely difficult to yeah. do. And he's managed to make progress in that area. So, so no, I think it does point to the fact that, you know, with these information technologies, you can reach people directly. You don't need big parties and big machines. It's different, I think, uh, in the U.S. because of the Congressional and Senate system, you need the machine. And in the yeah. U.K., we have constituency politics. The great thing going in France is proportional representation, yeah. uh, which allows a much more direct relationship between a candidate and people. Yeah, the, the difficulty in the U.S. Uh, uh, electoral system is it lasts so long. I mean, it's going on and on, and now people are already doing 2018 and 2020. And money, and money, 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 and money. And money, and yes, money is terrible. big. I mean, you need billions. Yes, and mm. actually this next question, you mentioned the flow of goods, services, products, and ideas, but you did not mention the flow of people. I think you did, and you said the yeah, other I, was I mean, previous you know, migration. Uh, if people who, who, who check me out will see that I wrote a book called Exceptional People, How yeah. Migration Ch Shaped Our World and Will Define Our Future, which Princeton University Press um, uh, published. Absolutely. <laughs> people are absolutely central to this. And, and the, one of the great asymmetries in globalization now is that that fundamental flow is being locked down. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, let me ask a question about climate change that's also come up. I know you did mention that in the book. There is a, some discussion of it and, and in your talk here. Uh, do we have time to avert a catastrophe or do we have to start planning ahead? One, one uh, suggestion I've heard is Really good to invest in companies that build dikes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Being near the be near the sea, a lot of dynamic cities on the coast. I think the answer is both. Uh, we there really are catastrophes. I, you know, Al Gore spoke at Zeitgeist yesterday, and as always, he was absolutely convincing and passionate uh, about it. And you know, he linked the Houston uh, hurricane. Uh, and a lot of recent events, what's been happening in not far from here in Northern California, the evidence is mounting that these things are already the result of climate change and, and just the heat that I experienced in Palo Alto today. Yeah. It, you know, these are, we, every day you have a new record. Uh, so it's happening, it dramatically impacts particularly on poor people. You know, being in Phoenix yesterday uh, at Zeitgeist, that's sort of a desert, you know. But mm -hmm. if you're wealthy enough, you pump water from far enough, you turn the aircon enough, you can live in the desert. Right. But for most people in the planet, that is not an option. Uh, and so it, it will exacerbate inequality. Uh, it will be particularly devastating for coastal cities. Uh, and a lot of the most dynamic places in emerging markets are, dynam are coastal, of course, here too. Um, and we need to act more urgently. So both, we, we need to make our societies much more resilient. We need to focus on what we can do uh, in all dimensions, particularly in agriculture and energy, et cetera. But we have to stop carbon emissions. We basically have to go to zero carbon within the next 20 years. That's dramatic. It's a revolution. Mm -hmm. You know we've never achieved this sort of thing economically before. It's a total revolution. It won't happen through market signals alone. It'll be helped by the energy and technology revolutions that we're seeing but it's going to require decisive action. 
a lot of assets, a lot of companies have to be revalued. Stranded assets is a real thing. You know, you don't want to be an investor pricing assets in the Arctic, uh, et cetera. So um, I think we need to do much more. And you know, I find it a tragedy in the US uh, what's been happening in terms of withdrawal. Two pieces of good news. One is that actually the withdrawal period is, the, uh, is after the next uh, presidential election uh, in the US. And secondly, what states, businesses like your own mm -hmm. uh, are doing uh, will already account for much of the movement in the US, despite the federal government uh, not being as committed as it was to this. So I don't think one should give up in the US at all. Is there a question back there? Yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts around income, in, in, income equality and drawing any parallels from Renaissance age. Was there a same problem at that time, and how was it addressed? Thank you. The, the data is, is, I think, pretty clear. It's not just income inequality, but health inequality. Inequality generally uh, is rising, and I think I gave the reasons for that um, in, in, in general terms. It's very important to, distinct, to, to think about why we care about it. Why does it matter? You know, do we care about how many Ferraris we see on our street, or do we care about how many beggars we see on our street, and is there some, or people starving, and is there a connection is the key question in my mind. China has experienced very rapidly rising inequality from a very flat base, and I don't think it's a problem for China because very few people are going backwards, and the, even the poorest people are experiencing significant rises in income and in the quality of their lives and health care and the life expectancy and so on. Where it becomes an issue is when some part of society is benefiting hugely and others are falling back. And that's what's happening to people in some Midwest towns in the US and parts of the north of England, parts of the countryside in France and in other places. And that's what explains rising extremism. The Renaissance echo is this tension between relative and absolute. Uh, and also whether it's seen that it's ill-gotten gains or not. Do the people that are becoming very wealthy deserve what they've got? And what people resented deeply and what the whole extremist movement in the Renaissance played on was that it was unfair. These people captured the benefits of it and didn't share them. And this concept of fairness and the ethics of it and whether people are being seen to pay tax and give back becomes important. Medici was tolerated because he was such a patron and supported people. But then, when extremism became great and when it was seen as increasingly corrupt, he was not tolerated anymore. And it was that that shifted. Uh, and of course, it was the information age that allowed people to observe, as the transparency does now, what was happening. Uh, that, the information was locked down before that by the church and by the royal, by the princes. Uh, then it suddenly became available. So information, knowing about inequality and the reason for it becomes fundamental. Absolutely right. And I, and I think when you look at uh, attitudes towards inequality, you survey people, they don't mind that athletes make so much or exactly. celebrities Absolutely. or entrepreneurs, bankers. On the other <laughs> That's, a different matter. That's a different story yeah. completely. I think we'll make this the last uh, question. Sure. Uh, thank you for coming to speak, speak to us today. I had a question about divestment. Divestment in South Africa uh, is, is generally seen as successful, whereas the divestment around fossil fuels, there's been a lot of conversation of whether it actually is something that's going to help us move forward to zero carbon emissions or not. Yeah. And especially, and here at Google, there has been talk about whether we should be moving forward and divesting from fossil fuels within the things that we invest in. How do you see this parallel with divestment in South Africa in comparison to divestment in fossil fuels? Yeah, very good question. I was absolutely uh, committed to disinvestment from South Africa. I thought it was a good thing, and I think that, together with sanctions and many other things, did accelerate the transformation of South Africa. I have no doubt in my mind uh, that it made the transition better and quicker uh, because of that. Um, I, I also believe that there should be very carefully thought through divestment from fossil fuels. There should be an understanding that investors are taking risk when they invest in strand assets. So it's an investment decision, particularly for pension funds and long-term investors, about whether these assets are really what they think they are. Um, but it's a broader one. It's about political signaling. So I don't believe, for example, my own personal view is that there's some oil majors who are the biggest investors in renewable energy in the world. I think we should not be divert 
discouraging them from that. We should be in the shareholder meetings, encouraging them to make a more rapid transformation, but we should be in there. On the other hand, there are people who are mainly doing things and are not transforming, and we should be discouraging them. So it's a, in a way, it's, a, it's about how you incentivize people to do the right thing uh, and absolutely penalize those that are not doing enough of the right thing. So it's a gradation. And of course, that's difficult politically. It's difficult to, to campaign and say, you know, don't uh, invest in this company, invest in that one. But that's what we should be. We should also understand that this is global and consumers have increasing powers. You don't want to simply divest from a democratically accountable company to have that asset mined or produced by a, a company run out of Russia or some other country. Just buy the, the assets cheaply and do the same thing. So consumers need to talk through the field. We should be targeting through divestment also the companies that are not making the transformation, for example, to electric vehicles, uh, who are lying about the content of their products. And also thinking deeply about some of the things which are very difficult, like steel and cement, which have a very, very high carbon footprint. So cradle to grave analysis, and this is where data analytics and a company like Google can help so much, these things really matter. Consumer awareness and then action around it. But I, I'm very proud that Oxford's divested. Uh, it was a hard discussion in Oxford. I'm also absolutely convinced that we will not lose any returns as a result of it, just like people used to make the argument around tobacco, etc. I've looked at the data deeply. I'm on the investment committee of my college and other investment committees, and there's no premium that you have to pay by doing the right thing. And so we need to do the right thing. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you again for coming. <laughs> thank you.